if you ask any commercial seaman, any working sailor, he will know the port of Geelong in the north of Taiwan as one of the busiest containerized ports in Asia and the second largest in Taiwan. Geelong is the second largest port by volume and has a long history of contact with the outside world. In that long history, aside from hosting a Spanish fort and a Dutch colony, Geelong in the 1800s was under the control of a Qing dynasty garrison. It's a bit of a surprise that Geelong is also home to the largest graveyard exclusively inhabited by foreigners in the whole of Taiwan. But these are not the victims of the 2019 pandemic or even that of 1918. This is an almost forgotten sidebar in history, but around 600 Frenchmen are buried right here in this cemetery, right here in the middle of Geelong. And all of them died in a series of bloody battles which took place between 1884 and 1885. And this was fought in what's essentially a sidebar to the Sino-French War of that same period. And it's a fight that also claimed the life of the rather famous Admiral Amade Corbet of the Far East Squadron of the French Navy. But what does the Sino-French War have to do with Taiwan and why are these men buried here? Now, China's interest in subsuming Vietnam is not a new thing. It didn't start with oil fields, it didn't start in that disaster in 1979, uh, and it went all the way back to the 1800s or to the 19th century. In 1882, French colonizers in Tonkin had run into Chinese expansionism and people who were themselves trying to gain parts of Vietnamese territory for their own purposes. By May of 1884, they had forced concessions from the Chinese via the Tianjin Accords the Chinese agreed to consider the north part of Vietnam as a French protectorate and basically leave it alone. Now this fragile peace ended in June of 1884 when the Guangxi army attacked a patrolling French column that was moving to a frontier town called Long Son. The outrage that followed in Paris forced Corbet to bring his Far East squadron to do a couple of tasks to teach the Chinese a lesson in a couple of different ways. The first move was Corbet took his fleet to the port of Fuzhou and destroyed the outdated and outclassed navy there and also sacked the naval yards. In August he was ordered to send a fleet here to Geelong to capture, not to just sack the port, but to capture the port to teach the Chinese a lesson. If you mess with us in Vietnam, then all China's northern ports can come under the same kind of attacks and can be invaded and occupied in the same way. French intelligence from 1884 suggested that Geelong was very lightly defended and should be a pushover. What I think they might have failed to acknowledge was the geography of Geelong, which as you can see has a lot of steep uh, and small hills and is very cramped and crowded. And indeed the name Geelong mean, means or meant in those days chicken cage. As, it, as in, it was as crowded as a chicken coop. So the appointment of Liu Mingquan as the 
Imperial Governor of the Armed Forces on Formosa um, sounds like a fairly large job title, but in fact the Qing had garrisons around half of the coast of the island and no, no control over the interior of, of the island. So, uh, as you can imagine, the main focus uh, then of uh, Liu Mingchen, uh, he could put on the defense of Jilong. Now, Liu Mingchen had distinguished himself during the quelling of the Taiping Rebellion. So he had recent uh, military experience and he had shown himself um, to, be, uh, to be a very capable military man. So seeing the defensive situation here, Liu Mingchen decided very quickly to build some fortifications around the area. One of those was here at Erxiaowan, and there was a second battery at Daxiaowan, from which guns could easily fire at anything coming into the harbor. And not being sure if the French would come here to Jilong or to the other port of Damsui, Liu put himself at a small town called Liodu, which is about halfway, and put himself in a position with some extra men in reserve that he could run in either direction quite easily, either down to Damsui or up here to Jilong. So while Courbet was easily demolishing the Chinese fleet in uh, Fuzhou, he sent his trusted Rear Admiral Le Bei to come here to Jilong, and on the 5th of August, they pulled in to the harbor down here. And this is what remains of Urshawan Paotai. This is the second of the batteries set up by Liu Mingchen uh, to fire at the French uh, that he knew were coming. This is a small hilltop. It's about 200 meters above sea level. And just through the trees, it's pretty overgrown. But you can see part of the harbor just down there. The derricks and the cranes are all just to, to the other side. By August of 1884, there were brand new forts and batteries installed up here behind me, which is Hohausan or the Lighthouse Hill. And another two batteries there and there at Da Shawan and Er Shawan, with all of which directly overview the harbor. By the end of August, Liu Mingchen now had 5,000 troops in the north part of the island ready to move to protect either the port of Jilong or the secondary port of Damsui. Okay. Now, while Corbet was busy demolishing the weak, outdated, and underwhelming Chinese fleet at the port of Fuzhou. His trusted right-hand man, Rear Admiral Sebastian Le Pe, was sent here to Jilong to capture the, the harbor, capture the town, and the neighboring coal mine at Beidou. On August the 4th in 1884, Le Pe appeared in what he presumed to be a surprise attack in the harbor of Jilong with three ships. He brought with him the ironclad corvette Le Galicionaire, the VR, and the gunboat Lutan. On the 5th, Le Pair, without further ado, demanded that Liu Mingchen surrender his forces, give up his coastal defenses, and surrender the entire town to the arriving French. The answer was a firm no. The Corvette itself had a main battery of six 240 millimeter 19 caliber guns and they started pounding the town in company with the secondary batteries of 100 millimeter guns and a total of six Hotchkiss rotary cannons of 37 millimeters. If that sounds like a flashy machine gun to you, have a look at this video clip and see what you think. The Chinese immediately returned fire from their positions on Hohaosan and the two main batteries at Ersawan and Dasawan, 
peppering the harbour with munitions to which French fire was returned, knocking out most of the Chinese guns. Le Pair immediately laid waste to the Chinese forts, the one here at Ho, at Ho Hao Shan and those two at Urshawan and Da Shawan, immediately knocking out the guns. Having knocked out the guns, Le Pair immediately launched raiding parties to attempt a landing. Uh, which they did uh, at the foot of the uh, at the foot of this hill and in the harbor mouth, um, which prompted an immediate counterattack from Liu Mingchuan with his somewhat superior force of a garrison of two and a half thousand men. And that ended. what followed was uh, euphemistically referred to as a fighting retreat, which left two Frenchmen dead and eleven wounded. Although the Chinese lost more men in the counter-attack uh, than the French, the French were still forced to re-embark their landing craft and return uh, to their ships under a constant barrage of rifle fire. Now, you might think that a setback like this would put this project on the back burner. But oh no, in Paris tempers ran hot and revenge was demanded. Corbet was told, do this job at all costs, take Geelong Harbor, capture it for France, and show no mercy to the Chinese. Whilst Corbet and Jules Patanotra had argued vehemently against the attack on Geelong and instead much preferred the idea of attacking either Port Arthur or Wei Highway, which are actually on the Chinese coast, they were told that basically the French, having been given a bloody nose in Geelong, had to take this objective. Not only was he instructed to take the port of Geelong, but also the coal mines at nearby Bardo and, and the other port at Damsway. Taking Geelong, the French hoped to finally extract compliance to the non-interference treaty which they had obtained in Tianjin and hopefully in this way to regain their lost honor in battle and wash away the humiliation of their defeat in August. However, Paris refused to give Corvée any more ships, any more men, any more money, and insisted that he just take his resources from Tonkin, or what's now Vietnam, and get the job done anyway. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Corbet pulled together everything he could spare from his bases in Tonkin and put together his invasion force. Three, four company battalions of marine infantry were formed, plus a marine battery and a scratch battery of two 80mm guns and four Hotchkiss cannon revolvers. A total of 2,250 men sailed from Saigon and Along Bay, joining the Far East Squadron off of Mazu on September 29th. Landings at Geelong began on October 1st. One battalion was put ashore at the foot of Ho Hao San, which the French had named Mount Clement, under cover of naval bombardment from several of Corbet's ships. Around four French were killed in action and a dozen wounded. Chinese casualties, on the other hand, were 100 dead and 1 to 200 wounded. Following the successful landing and establishment of a beachhead, the French were able to seize Ho Hao San and several more hills around the harbor and fortify them. They did not, however, have enough men to break out of the port area or to capture the desired coal mine at Bado. Liu Mingquan, having failed to hold off the French and despite having as many men, was under great pressure to repel the invaders. He left the other half of his force at Liu Du, just outside of Jilong, on the road to Damsui, and retreated to Taipei. 
Then a rumor started going around that he would flee to Shinzo and a revolt broke out with Liu being imprisoned at Longshan Temple in Taipei for several days to prevent his abandoning his post. Corbet, on the other hand, was now bogged down and committed to a long campaign to try and occupy Geelong permanently, tying him up and keeping him from his primary mission of keeping a grip on Indochina. Over the course of the next month, there was a spree of fortress building around Geelong on both sides, with each trying to shore up their positions to their best advantage. The Chinese launched a few attacks that lacked any clout or element of surprise and were beaten off to heavy losses. Determined to maintain the initiative, Le Pair launched a rather hasty attack here in Damsway after a mere two days of rather ineffective coastal bombardment. You may notice that, well, this is the fort. This is Fort San Domingo, which was the British consulate at the time and was home to a Chinese uh, battery. And just out there is the limit of the deep water. The Chinese had placed, you could call them uh, homemade explosives. They were towable torpedoes that they moored to make a barricade on the surface and prevented the French ships from sailing all the way up uh, to the front door, if you like. And instead the French had to start their naval bombardment or their attempt at landscaping from out there where the breakers are. So that wasn't very effective. Upon arrival, the Chinese cannons immediately engaged the French ships, took them under fire, and the French immediately replied with their full marine barrage. Many, many shells were fired at the fort, this area, and uh, the White Fort, more than two and a half thousand shells uh, were fired at, at this coast. Many of them missed their targets. Many European homes in the area were destroyed. And the grand effect of this coastal uh, bombardment was the knocking out of three of the Chinese guns. So at this point, Le Pair decided uh, that Chinese resistance had been uh, effectively dealt with and decided to attempt a landing. <clears throat> Le Pair instinctively knew that just knocking out three of the Chinese cannons wasn't going to quell resistance and he immediately dispatched messengers to run back to Geelong and ask Corbett for reinforcements. Le Pair requested another full battalion of Marines to assist with the landing, to reinforce the landing, but Corbet refused. Instead, Corbet gave Le Pair three more ships and their landing parties, which is far less than a battalion of men. So with his extra 600 men, Le Pair started making preparations for landing. His intent was to both capture the town of Damsway and also to clear the harbor for his ships to enter. Meanwhile, the Chinese forces had increased to about a thousand men, including the Hakka militiamen. General Sun Kai Hua divided his forces into two main groups. He put one group of, of, of soldiers behind the fort here and put his others onto a grassy ridge which is just over there, which would then flank the French as they tried to approach the fort. Now, uh, the fort is right behind the camera. Fort San Domingo is just a kilometer uh, over here. Also, the um, uh, let's call it the, uh, the wooded knoll uh, where the Chinese uh, snipers or the flanking force uh, was hiding. Now, you have the French, the French are behind, or their ships are behind the blockade, which is over here. And because the ships cannot approach directly to the beach, 
they're forced into using smaller boats and smaller craft, dinghies, skiffs, in order to make the assault. Now, once they've, once they've landed on the beach, there is this foreground which they would have to cross in order to actually assault the fort itself. They've still got, they've managed to knock out three of the guns. One of them is still firing at them. They've got, the Chinese have got their spotters and they're able to see exactly what the French are doing. They can see every move that they're making. Now, when the French had approached the beach, they, they saw a line of sand dunes and they thought that it would be open dunes all the way up to the foot of this hill. But the reality was that there was a lot of uh, open ground, there were rice paddies here and there, there were growths of uh, bamboo and so on, and the bottom of this slope here was also lightly wooded. So this is perfect territory for the Chinese to set up an ambush. And as the French Marines were unused to fighting in formed lines. Remember, these are fusilier marine, so they are not infantry. Uh, they are not trained uh, to fight in line formation, but their general, Le Pair, he was expecting them and ordering them to do this. Now, quite early in the day, quite early in the assault, uh, the buglers, both of the buglers for French lines, were shot and killed. This led to the situation where the, the commanders on the ground could not actually direct their forces in a disciplined attack. With the Chinese troops taking pot shots at them from behind uh, bamboo clumps or behind small trees, the uh, Marines, they rapidly used up their ammunition, just wildly firing at anything um, that looked like it might hide a Chinese. They were firing at clumps of bamboo, they were firing into random stands of trees without clear targets, and they, within a half an hour, had used up all of, almost all of their ammunition. At this point, um, I think desperation set in, and one of the officers was shot in the leg and went down, and the other officer, I think, uh, tried to Hail Mary pass, and he basically made a run at, uh, at General Sun Kai Hua's position and uh, attempted to capture the flag. Uh, very impudent. Um, and for this impudence, uh, he was cut down and beheaded on the spot. I'm not sure if that one act um, kicked off a, a, a spate of beheadings, but by the end of the day, six Frenchmen's heads were on pikes and on display in the, in the town of Damsway partly to show off, partly for advertising, and partly to stoke anti-French uh, sentiment in China. And uh, photographs of the, uh, the six beheaded Frenchmen were circulated in magazines in Shanghai. By the end of the day, uh, there was nothing for it, and the French had to sound a retreat, and what was left of their forces scrambled back to their boats. In the process, they dropped one of the uh, Hotchkiss 37mm cannons, uh, the repeating cannon that I showed you in video, off of one of the la their landing boats, and basically gave that as a present to the Chinese. And um, they rapidly left under gunfire with their tails between their legs, and uh, went back to their ironclad ships. Danzui was then and still is a home to a Canadian missionary hospital which treated Chinese casualties while the French only had their own sick bays aboard their ships within theatre. The Chinese troops and irregular fighters were also much more accustomed to the climate and or had some resistance to the diseases that were rife in 19th century Formosa. The French finally got out of the river mouth in the afternoon, transferring the more seriously wounded to the transport ship Neve, which set sail for Saigon and the French hospital there. De Horte was on this evacuation voyage, but died of his wounds just four days later. During this time, the British consul and one Captain Botteller of the Royal Navy went to visit General Sun to complain about the beheadings. They received the bodies of the victims for proper burial, which were then interred in Damsway. 
Chinese propaganda ramped up and started to claim up to 300 French being killed, which at the time was ridiculous, but would actually turn out to be a low estimate before the campaign was over. The defeat at Danzui was so resounding that the Qing court felt empowered to demand that France relinquish all of Tonkin and Amman to them in order to effect peace. We say that rust never sleeps, and neither does disease. And by November, the French had taken casualties, not from engagement with the Chinese, but surely from the environment itself. Typhoid, dysentery, cholera, dengue fever, malaria, all take their toll. In November, several outbreaks of the above diseases brought about the demise of 83 of the French force. Governor Liu, meanwhile, had persuaded a great many Chinese nationals to depart the Geelong area, giving up their homes, but also closing their businesses, abandoning the markets, quitting their jobs as domestics, as maids, as laundrymen, and leaving the French basically without much of a beachhead. So they occupied Geelong but they didn't have much in the way of local support from the civilian population. Now, being the smart chap that he was, Liu Mingchen had not rested on his laurels with his being able to hold uh, the French somewhat inside the port, and he rapidly started to construct facilities like this one and uh, <clears throat> and then was able to direct his guns uh, clean over the harbor and uh, at the surrounding approaches and he built um, three of these this one is called Sir Choling a second one at Hong Tan Shan and then the main fortification at Yue Mei Shan and very cleverly Liu Ming Chuan he made these very secure fortified pathways or trenches or even tunnels between the forts so that his soldiers could move from fort to fort, moving supplies, moving men as, as needed and having these sort of walls for a crouch behind uh, when you've already got the advantage of the terrain, you've got the high ground but you're also able to duck and cover under, under these kind of constructed pathways. So um, this is due diligence. Come late December, Corbet attempted a blockade of the southern ports of Tainan and Kaohsiung, but with only limited success. He wasn't able to enforce a complete blockade with the force that he had at his disposal. By this time in late December, Liu Mingchen's garrison had now reached the number of 25,000 men, although that included a great number of Hakka militiamen who were wild frontiersmen rather than trained soldiers, but they were loyal to the Qing and they didn't have much love for foreigners. Liu had brought reinforcements from as far away as Anhui and Henan. <clears throat> and by late April, a massive 35,000 men were available to him. In return, the French who were now occupying Geelong had reinforcements of a further two battalions which brought their strength up to around 4,000. That included six companies of the 3rd African Light Infantry and four of the Foreign Legion. But with this addition, it seems that all discipline and leadership completely evaporated. On the 10th of January, 15 bored Zephyrs took it upon themselves to try to assault this position with just 15 men led by one corporal. That didn't go very well. Uh, they needed to be rescued and extracted by a force of Marines. And this little excursion finally cost 17 dead and 28 wounded and was written off in reports as a reconnaissance mission. In a more orderly assault, Duchenne managed to bring his soldiers up the valley here 
to a point that we know as Fork Y. There he was, although unable to assault Yue Mei Shan directly, he was able to get his artillery on that position and also the fort at both Shecholing and also Hongdan San, which are, which are up here. The Chinese counterattacked and killed 21 of his men and injured a further 62, mostly from the African infantry and the French Foreign Legion. Having gotten their guns into position here, they were able to directly fire on Yue Mei Shan, killing even 2,000 Chinese in one attack. However, gaining these positions at this particular moment now locked the French into these high hills just in time for the coldest season in the year. Although it looks very warm and tropical up here now, you can take it from my experience as a Londoner, this place is cold and wet and miserable in January. The rain finally stopped on March the 2nd and Duchenne's launched a brilliant tactical attack. He managed to break through the Chinese lines at Beitao and then up to the hills of Hukeng Shan and Shen Ou Shan. The next morning they had descended into the valley of Shen Ao Kung and they were able then to march around to flank the Chinese line. And on the same day they had managed to scale and both Yue Mei Shan and Liu Keng Shan without even being spotted. Later in the same day they managed to capture both of those sites with the support of artillery fired from Fort Wai and Yue Mei Shan was renamed La Table for its flat topography. On the 7th they thrust towards Hongdan Shan and with the force of zephyrs that had snuck up the valley here at night they were able to surprise the Chinese fort at what they called Fort Bamboo or we know as Shecholing which is right there. Early in the morning they caught the Chinese completely by surprise attacking up the back of the ridge when they were looking toward the harbour and supported from artillery placed down here at Fort Y they were able to take both Fort Bamboo or Shecholing and also Hongdan San and Yue Mei San La Table in one fell swoop. The hoisting of the French tricolor on the top of the newly named Fort Bamboo raised howls of joy and cheers from the men hiking up the valley. Ships sounded their foghorns and the troops on the hills cheered back and I'm sure it was a joyous occasion for all of them. The Chinese, however, weren't so happy. In the afternoon of March 7th, a mixed column of legionnaires and marine infantry attacked southward along this ridge, which is known as Niao Zuifeng, against determined enemy resistance. The struggle for this ridge saw the fiercest fighting in the entire campaign. The Chinese for most of the day were able to hold this ridge and were finally rolling rocks down the slope to try to thwart the advance of the French soldiers. One Chinese infantry unit concealed themselves in the woods right here and at the last moment opened fire at point-blank range on the 3rd African Battalion, killing many of the French soldiers. Uh, the French were finally in the afternoon able to get up to the ridge and push the Chinese off down into this side. Finally they were able to push the Chinese right to the Geelong River just before sunset. In light of these tactical gains, Corbet felt secure enough to release several ships and an entire battalion of marines to take part in a raid to capture the Pescador Islands or Ponghu. Strategically the capture was an important victory which would have prevented the Chinese from further reinforcing their army on Formosa but it came too late to affect the outcome of the war. The Geelong campaign now finally reached a tipping point. It reached the point of equilibrium. The French controlling these uh, important peaks and ridges around the, city, around the town of Geelong now had an impregnable position that the Chinese no longer could assault. The Chinese themselves were forced all the way back to the Geelong River, even to the other side, uh, to stay out of the range of the cannons that the French were now able to put up on these ridgetops. 
However, the French were now unable to advance further. Liu Mingquan had firm control of the territory just out of range of the French cannons, so we moved in now into a stalemate. The French had these uh, strong positions on the ridgetops, the Chinese had a very strong position on the other side, and they just settled into trading artillery barrages just out of range of each other's guns. At this point, only a few minor skirmishes occurred during the next month. At the end of March 1885, the French reverses in Tonkin overshadowed Duchenne's achievements in Geelong. The shocking news of the French retreat from Langson in 28th March reached Corbeil at Margong on 4th April in a dispatch from Hong Kong. Corbeil was ordered to evacuate Geelong and return to Tonkin with the bulk of the Formosa Expeditionary Corps, leaving only a small garrison at Margong in the Pescadores. In the second week of April, Corbeil and Duchenzes drew up a plan for an opposed evacuation of Geelong involving a carefully phased daylight withdrawal from the frontline forts back to the harbour. A small rearguard would be left to hold the approaches to the harbour while the evacuation proceeded, supported by the guns of the Far East Squadron. In the event, this plan was never implemented as preliminaries of peace between France and China were concluded on the 4th of April 1885, bringing the Sino-French War to an end. On April 10th, Corbet was ordered to suspend plans for an immediate evacuation of Geelong, and on April 14th, he was notified of the conclusion of the preliminaries of peace 10 days earlier. Hostilities around Geelong now came to an end. Geelong was finally evacuated on June 22nd, 1885. Under arrangements signed by Le Pair and Liu Mingquan, the French withdrew, leaving their forts on Hong Tan San, Shaocholing, and Yuemeshan in stages. It took them three days to clear out their positions at the forts, and the Chinese were polite enough not to chase them out of those locations, but to give them a couple of days to pack their things and go. The Chinese officers kept their men well in hand and well disciplined and allowed the French to leave with dignity and honor. In his own remarks, Le Père states that there was not the slightest demonstration of triumph, nothing that could hurt our feelings, nothing that could wound our rightful pride. The French flag that had flown over Geelong for 21 months was lowered with a 21-gun salute from the ironclad vessel La Galaisonnaire, which was moored right here in the harbour. Colonel Duchesne, the commander of the French forces, was in fact the last of the French party to board the ship, and they set sail to Mazu. Now, there is a version of this story in which the French buried their dead at the foot of Urshawan, the fort, and it was later uh, moved to a better spot uh, in the town itself. Uh, but French historians dispute this uh, idea. It is known that on withdrawal from Geelong, that Le Pé had managed to negotiate a graceful withdrawal from the port and that the cemetery be laid out and that the French may return to look after and tidy up the cemetery on intervals. And this actually happened in 1889 and again in 1891. Corbet himself actually passed away from cholera which he probably contracted here in Geelong, but his actual passing occurred in the, on Mazu, not here. But the remains uh, of Corbeil were repatriated to France. Oh, the benefits of high rank. Despite the agreement between Le Pair and Liu Mingtran to maintain the cemetery, as we know, the Qing did not keep their hold of Taiwan. 
1895 marked the signing of the Shimonoseki Treaty, which ceded Taiwan to the Empire of Japan. And in 1895, the French consul to, to Taiwan had renegotiated the agreement to take care of the cemetery with the incoming uh, Japanese administration and indeed uh, the French came to look after the cemetery in 1895 and again in 1891. What we do know for sure is that in 1954 the remains in both Danswe and Ma Gong were both moved to this location so that the fallen French fr uh, from, from those uh, two spots could be relocated here together with their comrades. Now, it's believed that the monument here uh, was constructed in the Japanese period, uh, but, it's, but it isn't dated. Uh, it, it just doesn't look like a Qing dynasty monument, and it does look like something we do know that comes from the Japanese era. The final tally, as we know it, is that about 150 men, including two officers, were killed directly in battle, uh, both here and in Damswe, with another 120 later dying of their injuries. The remainder would have passed away from cholera, malaria, typhoid, dengue fever, and other tropical diseases. In fact, the general climate and the lack of sanitation at the time even killed over a hundred Japanese that came with the first detachment to the garrison in 1895. So that gives you an idea of just how hard it was to actually live here. Nowadays, the graveyard is under the care of the city government and French expatriates in Taiwan visit the cemetery each year in November to place flowers on the graves and hold memorial services. A traditional Taoist service is performed in the Chinese Ghost Month Festival, which is the middle of the seventh month in the lunar calendar. So, something is going on at the... French cemetery today. So I believe these are the preparations for the Chinese Ghost Month rituals to appease the spirits of the, the French uh, soldiers. <clears throat> So French flags, uh, Qing Dynasty flags for the whole celebration. So in uh, just a few days uh, there'll be this uh, ceremony to the fallen soldiers and to placate the spirits uh, of the French Marines and, and officers uh, that will reside here. And they will even bring uh, French baguettes and French uh, red wine, I think usually. Hong Jiu Ma Hao. You have any Hong Jiu Bai Jiu. Hong Jiu Bai Jiu. Hong Jiu Bai Jiu. Mian Bao. Mian Bao. The resting place of the officers and soldiers of French Marines uh, deceased in uh, Geelong, 1884 to 1885. That's the, that's the that's the script. Okay. That wraps it up for this video. That explains how and why 600 Frenchmen come to be buried here. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching. And my sincere apologies for my butchery of the French language. <laughs>